Damn, that is funky music. And how many people do you reckon are going to tune in just to sit here and watch you and I bang our heads? <laughs> just kind of dance, dance a little bit. Huh? Yeah. I reckon this is like great, great television, isn't it? You and I just sitting here banging our heads to funk music. Like, right? uh, yeah, like uh, Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what a film. What a film. This is, um, oh, man. This is one of my favorite guitar players, Corey Wong and Ariel Posen with a song called Spare Tire. Of course, you know, Facebook are going to mute this part of the live stream because we're using music that we don't own the right. copyrights to. <clears throat> hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Agency Hour. I'm Troy Dean, and this here is Pete Perry. How are you, brother? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Good morning. I'm freaking outstanding. I've had my morning walk. I'm on my second coffee. I had a meeting with the sales team this morning. You closed another Maverick. I am just... We had our big meeting last night with our with our coach. Dude, yes, we had a meeting yesterday with uh, Anna, our business coach. Things are good, I've got to say. Things are very, very good. I'm extremely lucky and I feel very blessed to uh, be where I am, even though we're in lockdown. I, I still feel very lucky uh, and very grateful. Um, hey, if you are listening in or watching this, please let us know which country you are from in the comments. Uh, just let us know. We just always like to know where people are. Remember to uh, grant permission. Oh, yeah. That's right. And click the link uh, near this video to give StreamYard permission so that we can bring your name and your face up on the screen. Uh, there we go. Uh, Just like StreamYard.com slash Facebook. <clears throat> Max is all over it. Um, and like Jill Brandon did, Jillian Brandon uh, said, cool guys listening while driving. Hey, Sunil Wu is here from New Zealand. Hey, Sunil, how you doing? I met Sunil years ago in, um, I tell you when it was, it was 2018. Uh, because Oscar was uh, a little tacker and I went over to Christchurch and ran a masterclass for some of our customers. Um, and no, that's not where I met Sunil. I actually met Sunil when I went to Auckland to speak at an entourage event. And while I was there, I had a meetup in Auckland with some of our customers and I met Sunil there and he's still around. So good to see you, Sunil. Um, how, how big of a trip is that for you from, from Melbourne to New Zealand? It's about, it's about four hours from Brisbane, four hour flight from Brisbane. So we fly oh. a couple of hours up to Brisbane yeah. and then about four hours out to, um, uh, to Auckland. Terry Loving uh, in the US, always playing catch up. Good, good, good. Hey, um, <clears throat> big announcement too that we wanted to share with you. We're not doing it this week, but we have decided uh, over the coming weeks that we are going, yes, I do remember, Sunil. I remember we had beers with Aaron, yourself, me, Russell Brown, and there was there was a girl there too whose name escapes me. We had beers and, a, and dinner in a, in a little um, a brewery pub there, which was great. Um, we've decided that we're going to turn this live stream into a podcast. Oh, oh Meg, says, Meg says it was her. It was Meg Appleby, and that's right, it was too, Meg, and you're here on the call. It's a reunion. That's funny. <laughs> Fantastic. And then I came back out in 2018 when Oscar was just a, a little fella. He was like seven months old. We, we'd Eight months old, we did a trip to New Zealand, and I ran a masterclass in Christchurch, which Meg was at, ran a full-day masterclass in Christchurch, and then we drove around the South Island for two weeks. In a, nice. in a car, and it was amazing. Oh, New Zealand is just beautiful. Isn't that, isn't, that, wasn't that cool when we could actually see other people in person? <clears throat> yeah, I know. I know. Tell me about it. Um, yeah, so we're going to turn this. Uh, we're going to turn this live stream into a podcast. In, in fact, I, I should frame this. What we're actually going to do is we're going to start a podcast called the Agency Hour, and we're going to film it live here in the Facebook group. So we're going to pivot. We're we're two weeks in, and we're going to pivot already because uh, that's what we do here. So that's very exciting, um, and we've got a whole bunch of guests lined up over the coming weeks that are going to be coming in and talking to us, and we're going to be bringing uh, the coaches in and uh, showing off some of the IP and some of the kits that we have that we're developing here. So we're very excited. We're going to get a few episodes in the can, as they say, before we launch it, <clears throat> and we'll do a big push when we launch the podcast and get all you guys excited about it. Uh, and so... Let us know, uh, I'd love to know in the comments, where do you listen to podcasts? Because I'm a bit old school and I kind of went looking at iTunes the other day and I, I think iTunes are kind of 
it looks like they're abandoning their – well, it looks like they're abandoning iTunes. It looks like they're kind of pivoting to kind of Apple Music and Apple Podcasts. Right, so, right, right, right. I, I mean, I use Spotify to listen to my podcast these days, and occasionally I might use Downcast, but I just find it's all on Spotify, which is – so where do you guys listen to your podcast? Let us know so we can make sure we get this podcast into your favourite podcatcher, as they call it. Um and uh, and we'll make sure that we uh, do everything right there. Cool. Zach says Apple Podcasts or Overcast. All right, good, good. Um, hey, dude, how how are you? What's going on in uh, in in Kingston, New York? Well, it, as my father used to say, it's raining harder than a cow pissing on a flat rock. I'm not sure <laughs> what that means. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but. Well, it means I can, it's raining I mean, hard. It means it's I raining visual, really hard. I got a visual, and I reckon that's pretty splashy. Yeah, so, exactly. um, <laughs> well, raining hard. At, well, so we in are, Australia, we're getting, the, we're getting the tail end of of the hurricane that came up through New Orleans. We're just getting rain, nothing bad. But um, right. yeah, so it was pretty bad down there. But so if you're yeah. if you're from down there, um, let us know you're okay. You're probably not with us because you're you don't have any power. Right. But, uh, so, so, so I heard this on the news the other day. They said it was like the worst storm in U.S. history. It was going to be worse. It was than pretty Katrina. bad. Yeah. I don't know. So, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's true, but it was. It right. was pretty damn bad. Um, but I think we're a little better prepared for it than we were in previous years. So, so you know, what, it, it, that's just what we need is like hurricanes and storms. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because the world's not messed up enough. Right. Um, so I heard the other day. I was listening to an. Uh, so it's like the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, which it, it, just it was the same exact right. It was the, it was on yeah. that day that the storm yeah. hit. This almost Far the out. same exact place. Yeah, it's crazy. and and I heard that in Hurricane Katrina, I didn't realize this, but it wasn't actually the storm that did the damage. It was the breaking of the levee. Right, the it levee the, broke. The, yep. Right, just yeah, like the broke. old Led Zeppelin song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, it was, it was bad. And, and so they, they, because it's, uh, New Orleans is actually below sea level. Right. So Ouch. when the levee broke, it was all over. Man. So it didn't happen this time. There's lots of flooding, but the, the <clears> levee okay. held up. All right, so. cool. All right, well, let us know. If you're in uh, Louisiana, uh, let us know that you're okay. Um, hey, and uh, for Max and Maddie and Emily in marketing, check this out. Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts. There we go. Pocket Casts. I haven't yeah, heard of that podcast. one. There we go. So I think... As long as we have a – we use Omni Studio to host our podcast. By the way, we, we stopped podcasting at the end of 2019. WP Elevation Podcast stopped back then for a number of reasons that I won't bore you with. Um, but we're, we're, we're back with a new podcast called The Agency Hour. And there was a podcast called The Agency Hour a few years ago. They, uh, there was a bunch of guys that worked for an agency – and they produced a podcast called The Agency Hour. They produced 25 episodes. It stopped in June 2019. So as we say, use it or lose it. Too bad. We're going to steal the name and roll with it. Um, so as long as we publish it in Omni Studio and, and get the URL right, I think it'll feed into all of those podcast players. I think we might just need to submit it to Spotify separately. So um, so uh, I, uh, I'm a podcast virgin. Really? I've never mean? been, I've never, not only have I never hosted a podcast, I've never been on a podcast. Are you serious? I am dead serious. Wow. It, dude, you have a voice like crispy butter. <laughs> like, how are you not? <laughs> what is what crispy a, butter? I don't know. It's like toast in the morning <laughs> with butter that's melted, oh, but it's geez. just a little crispy in a pan, you know? It's like, it's a good thing. It's like. It's smooth, but it's got a bit of an edge. Do you know what I mean? I just made that up. Yeah, you made up crispy butter. I know you did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I've no, I just of, never have. I've, I've, I've always been. Voice. I've always been a little voice. insecure about it, to be completely yeah. honest. And uh, right. yeah. What is it? Is it the sound of your? Is it the sound of your own voice, or is it that you're not going to? You're not going to know what to say, or I'm is just. It, what, gonna, what, I'm just afraid that my hair is not going to look good. You know. Right. Yeah. Really well, I understand. Really I mean, you look like, but dude, you look like George Clooney. Everyone says that. So, I mean, and also podcasts are mainly audio, brother. So, I know. You know, I, know. It's, <laughs> I think if there's video, I think they call, I think the young kids call that a vodcast. Vodcast. <clears throat> vodcast. Hey, on today's show, by the way, we're going to <clears throat> reveal the secret document. 
Where's my uh, the se- oh no, it's X Files. It's good, isn't it? It's the Twilight Zone. We're going to reveal the secret document that can completely change the way you hire and recruit team members. And this applies even if you're just working with other freelancers and other contractors, right? This is the one thing you should do, the one document you should have in your business. And I'm going to, we're going to show the screen. I'm not going to give you the document, but I'll show you the screen long enough that you can take some screenshots and copy it. Cause I know that's what you'll all do. Um, and this is the one thing that you should get dialed in before you think about hiring anyone or bringing anyone else on in your team. We're going to talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment. But before I do that, I just want to talk about why you should, because I know a lot of people are, myself included, I remember way back when, let me tell you a story, story time with Uncle Troy. Let me tell you a story about how I went out to, when I first started out as a freelance web designer and I was feeling a little bit overwhelmed and I was like, I can't grow this thing because there's only one of me. I need some help. And I went out to lunch with my wife and her, who was my fiance at the time, and her godmother. And we were sitting out on the water at this beautiful restaurant in Sydney. And her, her godmother said to me, just hire someone, just put up a job ad at a local university and find a web design student to come on and help you, right? You can't do it on your own. And I was terrified. I was like, I'm not going to do that. Are you kidding me? I'm going to have someone asking me questions all day. Like, how do I do this? And how do I do that? And where do I go to do this? And then I have to pay them. And what if I don't get enough business to pay? I was absolutely terrified of bringing on my first team member, right? And I get it. It is very scary. However, I will say this. The, there is the own, I believe the only way to free yourself from your own creation is to expand your team and bring people on to help do things to free you up so that you can spend more time in your sweet spot. So, Pete, I just want to talk. And I remember when you and I first met, actually, you were also a little bit skeptical of bringing on team members and maybe a little bit. I, um, I was, that was our first, uh, I won a, I won a one-on-one coaching call with you in September, 1943, 1943. Yeah, no, 1943. <laughs> September, 2015 during and, the war. Uh, and, and we won't, we won't talk about the beginning of that call. <laughs> Do you remember? You and I have different memories about this. All I remember is turning up. And you being on Skype and having your arms folded and being like, this is bullshit and I don't believe a word you say. And being really sceptical. But you have a different memory, right? Oh, my God. (laughs) What happened? I was very upset because I couldn't get Skype to work. And we were doing it over Skype. And I couldn't get Skype to work. And I thought you were going to bail on me. And like, this is the, you know, you're the great Troy right. Dean. And my, well, at least I thought so. I thought so. At right. the time. Like you were a rock star to me. And yeah. um, now, now you're my roadie. <laughs> no longer. Oh! <laughs> Fantastic. But, uh, Love it. No, you know, I was, I was a little intimidated. I was, I, and, and I couldn't get Skype to work. Couldn't, and I, I actually got up and left thinking, Oh, well, there goes my shot. And I came back and I rebooted my system. I came back and you had been sitting there on Skype waiting for me for like 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, Jesus, what the? So I was, it wasn't anger. It was just uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. Oh, there you Um, go. But anyway, yes, we, the first conversation we ever had face to face was you kind of encouraging me and walking me through the steps of hiring my first, my first developer. I, I, I remember that. I, I totally still have that guy. That. I still have him on my team. Yeah, I totally remember that. And yeah. I remember because I'd made some uh, catastrophic mistakes hiring people and, and trying to outsource and delegate. Right? I had no idea what I was doing and I made some really bad mistakes. And I remember talking to you on Skype that, that night and I remember, you, I remember thinking, I know exactly how you're feeling right now and I know you're sceptical and I know it sounds like work, but I also know it's the only path you have like it's mm-hmm. either this or you burn out and you just keep spinning your wheels and um and then to your credit dude you went off and you took massive action and you came back and you started feeding back and you started telling me what was happening and we kept the conversation going and then 
you know, that, that yeah. journey has been amazing to see you go on that journey and then end up helping others do the same. Yeah. So I hired my first person. Uh, it took me about a month to find them and onboard them and everything after that call. So let's say probably early or late October. And I hired my second person in mid November. So like weeks later I hired, I hired a, yeah. what you would call a VA, I guess, you yeah. know, runs my care plan. She's still with me too. Yeah. So I didn't waste any time. Like you, you yeah. encouraged me to take massive action. And I figured one wasn't enough Two is massive. Let's go. Yep. And, uh, and that's typically what happens is once you start to delegate and, and you start to see the results, it kind of opens up that pathway in your brain. And then you're like, okay, you know, now let's do this again and let's get rid of this other stuff off my desk that I don't want to do. So um, let's, let's talk about that word for a second, delegate. Cause mm. when we started talking about the job, do, talking about the job scorecard tonight, mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, the fact that I think I look at the job scorecard as it's the evolution of, delegation. So mm -hmm. I think when, when I first hired somebody, you start out by delegating tasks, like, a, like mm -hmm. go do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. And, and then when you're done, come back to me and I'll tell you what else to do next. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how you start delegating. Eventually, if you're smart and well coached, you move on to delegating decisions. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you move on to delegating outcomes. And that's where the mm -hmm. job scorecard comes in. Mm hmm. Yeah. So. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is the, and that, I think that comes from trust, right? You can't, yeah. you know, like I, I remember, I mean, now, I mean, yeah, take a step back. I remember talking to Simon Kelly about this at one point and going like, you don't need my permission to just like make a decision. I trust you enough to make a decision. Right. Um, I've had this conversation with Max, uh, you know, a bunch of times as well. Max, I, I'm, I'm never going to trust you enough to make a decision. So please run everything past me. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 in fact, now I'm at the point where it's like, I get pissed off if people ask me too many questions. It's like, you don't need to ask me questions. I actually don't know the answer, right? You're better at this than I am. So please just go make a decision. And then when, then when trust, then when you build more trust with someone's ability, then delegating outcomes is incredibly liberating, also really scary, but it's not only um, liberating for the business owner, it's liberating, I think, for the team member yes. because it gives them more autonomy, right? Max it, is not. And it, gets you, it gets them, you, you're not in their way anymore. That's right. Exactly. If, you, if, if you did it right, you hired people that are better at that task than you are. Mm -hmm. And so get the hell out of their way. That's right. Let them do their yeah. thing and Correct. just tell them what done looks like. Or, or help them figure out what done looks like and yep. then step back and yep. let the magic happen. Love it. Um, we're going to dive in and, and have a look at the job scorecard document in a moment. I do need to give a shout out to um, the creators of this, which I will do in a minute. And also I'm going to talk about a book later on. I'm going to give you a book recommendation that I'm reading at the moment. I've just about finished, which is just b completely blowing my mind. It's like, I think it's the best book I've read in a long time. And I know I say that about most books I read, but this is this is just above and beyond. This has raised the, the bar for me. Before we do that, I want to know from you guys in the comments, what, what if you could wave a magic wand and hire someone right now in your business, putting finances aside, let's just put finances aside for a second, right? If you could wave a magic wand and hire someone in your business right now to add to your team, who would it be? What would the role be that you would hire? And then I want you to start thinking about, and I'll walk you through the template in a moment. I want you to start thinking about the outcomes that that role is responsible for and how you are going to measure the performance or the success of that role. And I always think about sporting analogies, right? I always think about, you know, I watched the last dance last year during lockdown, the F fantastic documentary on the Chicago Bulls. Two three-peats, as they call it, uh, in the 90s. They won the championship three times in a row in 92, 3, and 4, and then in 96, 7, 8, I believe. And um, one of my really good friends is actually married to Luke Longley's brother, and I've met Luke Longley a couple of times, and uh, he was part of that Chicago Bulls team that won the second three-peat. Now, his role, you measure his role by number of tap-outs from the center. That was his job. I mean, the guy's 94th. 94 feet tall and his job was basically just to tap the ball out jordan's job is obviously to put the ball in the in the ring 
uh, Dennis Rodman's job was uh, was uh, rebounds, right? That was he was the master at rebounds. So everyone had a role to play, and we knew, and they would look at the stats at the end of the day and say, "Cool, man, like you know, Luke Longley, twelve shots, you know, thirty eight tap outs, whatever." That's how you measure your performance, and that's how you improve over time. And everyone on the team knows what that person's responsible for. Um, Zach says, project manager in sales. Sunil Wu says, I'd hire someone to do cold call lead generation. That's interesting. Uh, cool. So let us know in the chat what you would, uh, who you would hire if you could. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the, uh, if I can figure out how to, there we go. Here it is. I'm going to bring up the job scorecard template. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. And... You know, if you happen to be just listening to this at some point in the future and not watching it, then I strongly suggest that you get on over to the Digital Mavericks Facebook group and check out the Agency Hour show and have a look specifically for the Agency Hour uh, related to the job scorecard template uh, or the job scorecard and uh, check out what we're sharing on the screen. So here it is. This is the job scorecard template. You might notice that this is a document that we have built out in ClickUp. And let me walk you through the three main components of a job scorecard. And a huge shout out, first of all, to, I learned this from a, a book called Who, W-H-O, by Jeff Smart. Now, that's actually not the book I'm going to recommend, but that is definitely a book worth reading. It's just called Who by Jeff Smart. Jeff Smart's father, Brad Smart, wrote a book called Top Grading, which is basically all about how to hire a players, and it's meant for much larger businesses. Jeff, uh, his son, wrote a book called Who, which is a really practical guide uh, as to how to recruit uh, A players in a smaller business, and it gives you a whole process you go through from, you know, where to find talent, how to interview them, all that kind of stuff. It's a really good book. It's very detailed. This is really at the heart of what they teach, which is not a job description. It's a job scorecard, and the three – we've we've – um, we've embellished this and augmented it quite a lot, but the three main components of the job scorecard as, as Jeff teaches it in who are the mission, right? The outcomes and then the competencies, right? So we, as I said, ours looks slightly different, but I'm going to, I'm just going to walk you through the three main components. The first component is the mission. And the question here is, why does this role exist? Now, this is not generally not uh, quantifiable with, and I'm going to show you an example of this in a moment for a social media manager. If you were hiring a social media manager, I'll show you an example of this. So the mission is why does this role exist? So if I think about um, Michelle here, who's customer success manager, the mission of that role is to make sure our customers have access to the right products at the right time to ensure their success. And that's her job is to make sure our customers succeed. Right. Which and, is, is not necessarily measurable in and of itself. It's not, it's not no, a smart goal. No, not no. at all. It's yeah, a, which it's is a, okay. It's a, yeah. it, it is, it's a big statement, right? It's yeah. a, it's a big statement. It's like the, the mission of the coach of the Chicago bulls is to turn that team into the best team on the planet and to develop the players, right? Now they would measure that through championships, but that's a, that's a slightly separate conversation. The mission of, uh, of Michelle's role really is she's a customer success manager, but she's also a customer advocate. She goes into bat for our customers to make sure the company are delivering on our promise, right? So once you've, and, and sometimes this can be the last thing that you write on a job scorecard. Mm -hmm. Once you've, once you've designed the outcomes, then you might come back and, re, and write the mission last, right? Well, why this role exists is, is for this purpose. So then the second part of the job scorecard, as taught by uh, Jeff Smart, is outcomes. And, you know, we just follow the SMART, the smart goal uh, rule here, which is, you know, it's got to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So a SMART outcome, for example – for Michelle might be, uh, as customer success manager, might be to maintain our NPS above 80, right? Net promoter score tells us how well we're doing at serving our customers. Let's keep that above 80. Now, that's not 
time bound, that's not actually specific to a particular date. It's ongoing. That's an ongoing metric that Michelle is responsible for. There might be some other outcomes that are more short term. So, for example, when we did the rebrand exercise, when we did the rebrand project, Michelle's part of Michelle's uh, responsibility there was to make sure that all of our customers log into the new members website at academy.agencymavericks.com and they still have access to everything they bought when we were called WP Elevation. That was one of her smart outcomes, right? By 1st of July, customers log in, they still have access to everything. She's responsible for that. Nowhere does it tell her how to do that, right? Nowhere is there a list of tasks or a description of how she should do that. We just talk about what done looks like, okay? So I, you know, they say three to five outcomes. I don't think you can be responsible for any more than three outcomes in any role. I think that's just overwhelming if you're responsible for more than three. Charmaine, who's our customer support manager, for example, her number one number is our CSAT score, our customer satisfaction score. We survey everyone that we answer support tickets to. We send them an email saying, hey, how do we do? Rate our reply. And her job is to keep that above 90%. And she set that number, not me. Uh, and she does an amazing job. And everything else that she does can be measured by, hey, our customer satisfaction score is has slipped down to 85. What's going on? There's a problem that needs to be fixed. But as long as that's above 90, I don't actually care how she does it because I don't know how to do it. And this is, I think, the big challenge that most people have when they hire people is they hire a project manager, for example, and then try and teach them how to be a project manager. And unless you are a really good project manager, you shouldn't be hiring a project manager and then teaching them how to do it. You should hire them and then have them teach you how they do project management and just have an outcome that they're responsible for and then get out of their way and let them do their job, right? Um, so I want to show you an, oh, and then the third part of this is competencies. Like, you know, what are they going to have to be competent in, in order to do the job? So for example, they might need to be, you know, if they're a social media manager, they might need to be competent with, you know, some social media scheduling software, or they might need to be competent with WordPress because we publish all our blogs on WordPress. You might want them to have, you know, if they're going to interact with clients, you might want them to have good people skills and, you know, if they're a project manager, you want them to be super organized and punctual. So just some basic competencies that you require. But again, we're not telling them how to do their job. And then when we recruit, we just run people through this scorecard and we give them a rating. Uh, and our job is to make sure that we feel like, and we've, and we've run them through the, well, I won't go through the three interview process, but there's three interviews that we put people through when we, uh, when we recruit. And as a result of those interviews, we rate them against the scorecard and we say, hey, is there a 90% chance that this candidate is going to succeed in this role based on these outcomes? And if there's not a 90% chance that they're going to succeed, then we don't recruit them. Make sense? Yeah. Anything I missed, Pete? Any questions? Anything no, you want to add? No. Nope, okay. nope. Sounds good. Um, uh, let us know in the comments if you have any questions. Uh, I'm going to show you a template. I'm going to show you an example here. So of one one thing I'll add is uh -huh. this can be. I mean, you're talking about using it for hiring, mm -hmm. but once the once the person's in in the position, it can be used for a keeping them on track. They should be mm -hmm. checking back to their scorecard and saying is what I'm about to do going to help me reach these outcomes? 100%. And, Absolutely. And then it should be part of their evaluation annually or whatever you do. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's a living document too. You change yes. it, you change it, you change the outcomes. As they're achieved, you change them. Correct. <clears throat> so, you know, there, there ideally should be, you know, one – ongoing outcome that they're responsible for, which is just ongoing. So for example, Michelle, it's NPS, yes. but there might be other short-term outcomes that are project specific or that are, you know, and I'll walk you through an example here. There might be some outcomes that are, you know, Hey, so Emily's constantly coming to me going, I need to change my scorecard. And Emily's, Emily's really taken ownership of her scorecard and she uses it as a guide to make sure that she's doing the right kind of work. And she'll be the first to come to me and say, I'm, I'm, I'm off track. I'm not, I, I need to revisit my scorecard because I feel like things are moving so quickly. We either need to update my scorecard or I need to change my activities because I'm not actually doing what I should be doing, you know, relevant to my scorecard. 
And that's just because sometimes we, we, we knock it out of the park and we finish a project and we move on. So let me walk you through an example here for a social media manager. All right. And let us know in the chat if this is useful, because, you know, Pete and I will sit here and, and do this for hours, even if no one's listening, but it's always better if uh, what we're doing is actually useful for you guys. So just let us know with a yes in the comments, if this is useful um, and just to give us a bit of a, a temperature check on uh, what we're doing here. So here's an example for a social media manager, right? Don't worry about this, the interview stuff here, because that's a whole other conversation, but I just want you to pay attention to the mission, the outcomes, and then uh, okay, we haven't done the competencies here on this example. So the mission for this social media manager, the purpose of this role is to represent the organization on social media, give our audience a voice they can relate to and help generate leads with potential clients. All right now, none of that's measurable because it doesn't say how many leads, right? It's just, that's the reason that this role exists. Okay getting some yeses in the comments from Zach and Cassandra and anonymous Facebook user. Thank you very much. So that's the mission of the role. Now let's look at the outcomes. So by the end of Q3, ensure all social media platforms and content is on brand and consistent. Now th th there's, there's a little bit of subjectivity in here. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit, little bit too much subjectivity for my liking around the word consistent. Like, what does that mean? On, on brand, I get. Like, if, I, if we see social posts that just don't match our style guide, it's like, why the hell are we using those colors and that font? That would be a problem. Tone of voice, like, hey, we don't say that in Agency Mavericks. That's not who we are. That would be a problem. Consistent, I kind of get. I would, okay, look at our Facebook, look at our YouTube, look at our Instagram. It's all got to kind of feel like it's coming out of the same uh, the same house that's probably a little subjective and not super, super quantifiable, but it's better than it's better than writing out a list of things that the social media manager has to do, right? That's the outcome. I don't care how they get there, but that's the outcome that we're looking for. The second one here is, is, is I think, much more uh, quantifiable. Increase social traffic to website by 100% by the end of Q3. In other words, let's have a look at Google Analytics, look at where our traffic's coming from, and by the end of Q3, let's double the, the amount of traffic we're getting from social media, organic social media, not paid, right? And generate 150 leads per week from social media by the end of Q4, which uh, would be, you know, in America would be December. Here in Australia would be June because we have a, a fiscal year that runs from July to June. That's quantifiable and we can measure that through our analytics tools. And um, again, I would probably, like revisiting this now, I would probably want to say uh, generate 150 marketing qualified leads per week from social. In other words, like, cause 150 leads is pretty easy, right? You just, I mean, you could just crank them up and get mechanical Turks or Fiverr right, to right. get leads, but you want qualified leads. So I, we, I might want to put, this would be a good starting point, but over time I would want to probably dial that in a little bit and say, Hey, well, what is a, what does a qualified lead look like and how do we, get qualified leads and, and not rubbish leads. So they're the outcomes. Now, do I care whether Maddie uses, who, who runs our social media, do I care if she uses Buffer or Hootsuite? I couldn't give a shit what she right, uses. Exactly. Uh, I'm not interested. As long as what she uses is congruent with what the rest of the team is using. There's not like we're all in, we're a HubSpot shop now, so we're all in HubSpot. There's no point in her using Buffer if everyone else is using HubSpot and, and there's no integration, right? So, She's got to play by the rules and kind of work with the team, but I don't care when we post or what we post. That's not my job to figure that out. It's Maddie and Emily's job to figure out what we post, when we post it, to get the engagement, to deliver these outcomes, right? Right. If they that want sense. to stop using Canva and start using Photoshop, they can do that. I don't We don't care. You don't care? I don't care. care. It doesn't we matter care. to me. No one cares, right? Because, and I'll tell you why I don't care, because I'm not very good at this job, being a social yeah. media manager. It's not my sweet spot. So I can't train Maddie how to do it. I, I don't even know how to use Instagram. Maddie said to me once, oh, can you put a story up on Instagram? I'm like, yeah, no worries. And I pinged her back 15 minutes later. I'm like, listen, I reckon I'm pretty smart and I'm not that old, but I cannot for the life of me figure out how to add a story to Instagram. Where's the story button, right? And she had the top left. That's the story. I'm like, okay, there it is. So I have no idea 
Paddy's Instagram. I don't even have WhatsApp on my phone, right? My wife's like, you miss out on all these great conversations with our friends because you're not on WhatsApp. I'm like, hey, shit, I'm like, what? if you want to talk to me, ring me. Uh, so I let Maddie go and do that stuff because she knows it. I don't, uh, I don't even know how to do it, right? And I'm not interested in learning because I've got other things that I want to do. So, so is this useful? Uh, uh, here we go. Clive says, yes, and helpful to hear that we should hire people more specialised experience than ourselves. It makes perfect sense, but not perhaps naturally what we do. Yeah. Why is that? Why do, why do you think, Pete, that we hire people and then try and train them rather than just hiring people who already know how to do the job? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Is it psychological? A, I think it is. Are we, is it like an insecurity thing? We don't want them totally. to be better than us? I think, I think it is. It's an imposter syndrome. We don't want them yes. to know that we don't know how the hell to do it. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Bang on. That's exactly. It's, that must go. be what it is. Yeah. Three cheers for Pete. That's exactly what I would have said. I would have said, we don't want to be found out as being an idiot. Right? Right. <laughs> Whereas I now want to be the dumbest person in the room because yeah. otherwise, what's the point? I'm not learning anything. Right. Um, so, I think it is a control thing. I think we want to feel like we're in control. And if we hire people who are smarter than us, then we're a little bit scared that we might become redundant and that they might not need us or they might go, well, you're a bit stupid. I'm going to go work for someone else because I'm not, you're not learning anything from you. Right. Yeah. It takes a little so think, uh, emotional intelligence, I think, to be able to do that, you know, just be able to put down those insecurities and move forward with hiring the best that you can get. They're not going to take over the company. <laughs> like, That's right. They're not they're going not to be the company. CEO. Like, they're not. They're not going to do what they did to Steve Jobs and throw you out. <laughs> That's right. They're not. It's not going to happen. You know, be, being, a, being a business owner is incredibly risky and takes an enormous amount of emotional resilience to get up every day, come to work, get punched in the face 150 times, get up the next day and do it again. Most people – don't want that responsibility. Most people just want to come to work, add some value, feel like they belong and that they're important, get paid well, and they don't want the added responsibility of owning a business. So the vast majority of people that you recruit just know that 97% of them don't actually want to, on average, 97% of them don't want to start their own business, right? They, they just want to help you grow your business. And I also think once you realize the way I got rid of my ego, because I was terrible. It's always to micromanage the shit out of everyone. I've, I've had people leave the company and on the way out go, dude, I can't do my job. I, I'm just like, you've got my hands tied behind my back and you come in at the last minute and try and save the day and it's just, you know, it's horrible. So I've had to learn and the thing that the, the, the thing that's got me there is the realisation that the only way to move faster and go further is to empower other people to do an amazing job and for me to get out of their way. And that is what actually frees me up and reduces my stress. And it also is incredibly liberating because then I can put my hand up and go, I don't have the answers. I don't know. Stop looking at me for all the answers because I'm the dumbest person in the room, right? You guys figure it out and right. then tell, just tell me what to do. Um, Andrew Tate says, I'm finding this interesting after having run with this for a team for 15 years in my previous life, I thought I had said goodbye to all that, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like Andrew is embarking on a new venture. Um, Zach says, if you aren't hiring people smarter than you, you aren't truly growing your business. Sure. You might be able to bill more hours, but you won't be improving your offerings. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I know that we're not far away from us having products in this company that I have nothing to do with developing them or delivering them or marketing them. We're not that far away from that reality, which is incredibly rewarding for me to see, to be able to see that light at the end of the tunnel. That's Zach. That's exactly right. What Zach just said is, is uh, really a great comment. Being the only person with the answers makes you the single point of failure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. So I'm interested in uh, what Andrew said here. Don't forget that this all takes time to run and review and try it ties in with staff mm -hmm. development and training. So I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not just as easy as a single sheet of paper. This yeah. is a key part of an entire recruiting process. This mm -hmm. is, and we're only showing you one piece of it right now, yeah. but it right. is a big piece. It is a big piece, 
but it's of a big, bigger system. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, just, I'll just, uh, where are we? Here we go. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Let me just share my screen again for a second here, Max. Um, here's a very, very high level 30,000 foot flyby of our entire recruitment process, right? Here's everything you need to do to onboard a new candidate. Um, what we do, one of the first things we do is develop the job scorecard, right, for a role. Then we review the job scorecard with the team for feedback and go, hey, is this – actually, first thing we do is the org chart. Org right? chart's first. Yep. I was going to interrupt you, but I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, please do. Please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, right? Create the org chart. I'm not going to walk you through this, but create the, the fut- what Pete calls the future-facing org chart uh, so that you know who you think you should hire next. Then – what most people do is go, cool, I'm going to go place a job ad up for a developer because I've identified a need to hire a developer and they put up a job description, okay? So instead of doing that, once you've got your org chart and you are, you've identified, well, I'm currently, as the business owner, sitting in five of the 12 seats in my org chart, exactly. which is the reality, right, when you're starting out. You might have another person sitting in three seats and eventually go, I'm going to replace myself out of these roles. Develop a job scorecard for the next role that you're going to hire then once you've reviewed that with the team and you're, and you're uh, comfortable with it, we post up a job ad and the job ad template is, is you know, kind of based on the, the – we have a whole job ad template that talks about the culture of the company and also the outcomes that that role is going to be responsible for, not the tasks that they're going to do. Then we have people apply. We have a, a form, an intake form that we use. People apply. They end up in the short list and then we put them through three – uh, you can see this is just a test board I'm using here. Uh, we have three interviews that we put them through, a culture interview, a competencies interview, and a commitment interview. Then we check their references. Then we make them an offer, and then we sign the contract, and they're done. Or if they're not uh, done and they don't accept the offer uh, or we don't offer them, we might just put them on what we call the bench. We just put them on the bench for later because we might yeah. need to pull them in a little bit later. So that's the entire process at a very high level, but it really comes down to – uh, the job scorecard is the uh, is the thing is is kind of really at the heart of it, right? It's if the linchpin, yeah. Correct. If yeah. you don't get that job scorecard dial in, then then you you're flying blind because you yeah. don't know the outcomes that person is responsible for. And just to Andrew's point, and I'm going to make my book recommendation. I've learned over the years that my job as a as the CEO is to empower and mentor everyone on the team to become the best version of themselves at work so that they can achieve what they didn't think was possible because that is what gives people an enormous amount of pride and meaning in their work is when they can turn up in front of the rest of the team and take pride in what they've achieved and that they've achieved something that they might have known that they could achieve, but they didn't really think was possible. My job is to help them get those results. It's not, to jump in and do the job for them, right? And the book I'm going to recommend, which is just completely consolidated and validated everything I've been learning about leadership and and developing people over the last few years, and it, it for me it's it's like the benchmark on how to do this really well, is a book called Good Authority by I believe his name is Jonathan Raymond, and I'm just going to look this up. Good Authority: How to Become the Leader your team is waiting for how to become the leader. Your team is waiting for good authority by Jonathan Raymond. Now, interesting fact, Jonathan Raymond was uh, the former CEO and chief brand officer of the E-Myth organization, which of course was uh, um, Michael E. Gerber's company that he grew into a, a massive international branded coaching company uh, he led the transformation of that global coaching brand um, into the digital age, really. So he was the former CEO and chief brand officer at Emith. Huge amount of experience in, in in running teams. He now has a company called Refound, and their whole motto. And really, if you had to distill this book down, and their whole approach to leadership, if you had to distill it down into four words, it is more Yoda, less Superman. Mm. It is the whole ethos of and their philosophy towards That's leadership, good. right? And That's it's good. It's just it's and I have been Superman in the past, and um, 
And uh, I'm on this journey to become more Yoda and less Superman. So Good Authority by Jonathan Raymond, definitely a book worth checking out, as well as Who by Brad Smart. And uh, and then I would encourage you to have a think about, you know, the role that that you are thinking about hiring and uh, think about the outcomes that that role is responsible for. And I want to talk about one specific example, Pete, because a lot of people have a problem when it comes to designing outcomes for specific roles. Mm-hmm. One that I'm thinking of in mind is a developer. Yeah, it's tough. A lot of people say, well, so what is the what is what is the outcome that a developer is responsible for? I have some thoughts on this, but you tell me. Like, what what do you think a developer? What, how, how do you, how do we know? So I'm, dev- I'm not sure that I'm doing a good job of this in my agency. So I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. But um, most of what I've got my developer working on is so my developer does does both works in our care plan division of our company, if you want to look at it that way, and also does, um, you know, website builds and things like that. So um, care plan, it's easier to measure because uh, everything is about timing. Like you got to get these things done in, in so many hours. Um, so that one's relatively easy to measure. The other one is a little bit harder. It's, it's a, and I've got it set up so that he's responsible for tasks or projects coming in on, on time. So we come up with a deadline and projects that come in on time. That's a, that's a gold star for him. And if it doesn't, then that's a problem. Yep. Yep. And that is where, that's where most people start with a developer role. And I think in the absence of anything else, that's probably a good place to start. Um, What I've learned uh, over the last probably 18 months to two years by talking to a lot of people in Mavericks club who have teams of developers is I believe a developer, if they're not, I believe everyone in the company has a customer, right? My, in my role as the CEO, my, I have two customers. I have my, I have our clients, our coaching clients and our customers in our programs. And I have the team. My team are also my customer. I serve them and I serve our clients. I believe everyone in the company has a customer. Sometimes that customer is the company's customer right? Sometimes it's another person or another department within the organization. So developers, for example, if they're not interacting directly with a client, then I still believe they, a developer has two customers. They have the customer who we're building a website for, and they have the account manager or the project manager, or if there is no account manager or project manager, then the company, the business, the agency owner is also their customer. Let me, let me explain. The, in the absence of any number, if you don't have a number for a developer and you can't figure out a number for a developer or any other role, right, then the, the number I think that you should be measuring is called CSAT, customer satisfaction, C-S-A-T, customer satisfaction. So when we launch a project for a client, it's very simple. It's a, the CSAT survey is very, very simple. How would you rate your experience with us based on this project that we just launched for you? And it's a rating out of five stars, or you can just use sad face, neutral, happy face, right? Uh, When we send support tickets out of HubSpot, we use the sad face, smiley face, neutral face. So that's a customer satisfaction survey. They literally click a button. The customer literally clicks a button. Now Now, the developer's job is to help contribute to keeping our CSAT above four out of five stars, four or more, right? If we're three, there's a problem. If we're two, then hold the phone, something's on fire, everyone stop. If we're at four out of five consistently, everyone's happy. Now, the developer's job is to contribute towards keeping that CSAT at four. However, let's just think about this for a second because the developer could do an amazing job, develop everything, compliant code, accessibility, everything's super good, everyone's happy, it gets done on time, but the account manager may not have slept for the last three nights because the developer's gone missing and hasn't communicated and has just been in a bunker cutting code and hasn't communicated. And so the account manager's stressed out. So the other customer that the developer has is the team, right? Particularly the account manager or the project manager, if that role exists. So I believe you should also have what's called an ESAT, which is an employee satisfaction. So on a scale of one to five, rate, the, the team on this project and the project manager or the account manager should say, well, we got this done on time, but the developer went missing for three days and didn't answer my, my tickets in, in teamwork. 
Uh, and so therefore I was pretty stressed out. I would really love it if we didn't do that again. So I'm giving you a three out of five. Okay. So I'm not talking about lines of code or accessibility or compliance. I'm talking about who is the, who is the customer external or internal and how do we measure their satisfaction with that, that employee's role. Now, my job is to get, is to get out, is to keep our CSAT and our NPS where, where they are. And I help the whole team, mentor the whole team to do that. But also my job is to make sure our employee NPS or our employee satisfaction, which we're just about to roll out, is also four out of five. Because I don't want anyone here if they're not happy and they're not fulfilled and they're not developing. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so I think you can do that with every role. I think you can, I think you can do that with a designer because it's hard. Yeah. I mean, how do you measure design? It's, it's so subjective, right? But I think it's if the customer's happy and the team's happy, design has done a good job. Even if there are people on the team, even if you as a business owner are a designer and you go, Jesus, I would have designed that differently. Hey, customer's happy, team's happy, shut up and get out of the way. It doesn't yep. matter if you would have chosen a different color palette. That's no longer your job. You're an agency owner, not a designer. Right. Make sense? Yep, that does make sense. Cool. Uh, Clive Wilson says, fair and useful. Christopher Stratman's put a couple of links there to the good authority and who? Thank you very much, Christopher Stratman. Are you on the payroll here, are you? <laughs> Thanks for helping out. I really appreciate that. Of course, we will we will uh, grab, we'll try and grab any links that we can and stick it uh, in the description of this video once it gets uh, uploaded and published um, so that you guys can click on and, and, uh, and get those links. And, and as we mentioned at some point, we are going to turn this into a podcast and um, we'll actually host these with show notes up on the website. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited about um, rejuvenating the podcast and, and bringing a new podcast back because it's certainly something I've missed. And I want to thank the marketing team for leading that conversation and encouraging us to do it. Um, Pete, where, what time is it where you are? It's we, almost it 7 is, p.m. It is almost 7 p.m. where I am. But look at this. We almost made, we almost made a full hour. Yeah. The agency, 52 minutes. <laughs> Cassandra May says, I need to remove my control freak hat. Yes, you do. Uh, and you're in Sales Accelerator. Cassandra, by the way, just joined Sales Accelerator, I think, yesterday nice. or the day before. So don't worry, Cassandra, you're in good hands. We Welcome. will, we will uh, coach you through that. Jaden Navarrete says, I like this a lot. Thank you, Jaden. And um, hope you guys are enjoying this. Let us know what you want to learn. Let us know if you have any guests that you would like us to bring on or any particular topics that you would like us to talk about. Thank you very much to Max in the green room for producing this show. Looking forward to uh, it becoming a podcast in the near future. And Pete, once again, brother, thanks for joining in. Uh, love hanging out with you, man. All right. We'll see you again next Always week, guys. Same time uh, next uh, Thursday morning, Melbourne time. Till then, I'm Troy Dean. Have a great Pete day. Perry. Have a good night.